Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third in the History Reclaimed series of webinars on the British campaigns against slavery and the slave trade. And our guest this evening is Professor Lawrence Goldman, who is formerly uh, editor of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which uh, post he held for 10 years, uh, also former director of the Institute of Historical Research. He read history at Cambridge and then studied American slavery at Yale. Uh, he taught the history of American slavery uh, for, for some years in Oxford, where he is now a, a fellow, a life fellow of St. Peter's College. And so there is no one who is better qualified to talk to us this evening about the British campaign against, or the British abolitionist campaign uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in its domestic, uh, uh, and I suppose uh, it's also, it's, perhaps it's global, I'm not quite sure, dimensions. We've already had, those of you who listened in last week will know um, Professor Andrew Lambert talking about the naval campaigns against uh, the slave trade. And now we're going to hear, I think, of the, the as it were, the moral, intellectual and political campaigns against slavery uh, and the slave trade. And so, um, Professor Lawrence Goldman. Lawrence, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Robert, and good evening to everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me nice and clearly. Um, uh, I'm looking forward in the next half hour to taking you through quite a lot of history. Uh, it will be a, a, a fairly uh, rushed ride, um, but I hope you enjoy it. What I want to do is to explain the slave trade to people, to trace the causes of anti-slavery and the groups who led it in Britain, to examine the process of the legislation which led first to the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 and then to the emancipation of slaves later in 1833. And I want to consider why the movement was successful in Britain, why Britain came first in the history of anti-slavery. And we'll also consider inter alia as we go through the wider impact of the uh, movement on British public and political life in general. Well, let's begin in 1800 and see what the world looked like then before uh, the British movement had had any marked success. And it may surprise you. Well over three quarters of the population of the world then lived and worked as slaves or forced laborers. Free men and women in possession of their own person and labor were in the distinct minority, and today that may well seem incredible. At this point, close to 80,000 Africans were being transported across the Atlantic every year, half of them in British vessels. In total, between the late 15th century and the mid 19th century, something like 11 million Africans were taken across to the Americas, of whom about nine and a half million arrived. That means that roughly 12 or 13% of those shipped died en route. The European slave trade had initially been dominated by the Portuguese and the Spanish. The first mention of an English slave ship dates from 1555, but by the 18th century, the British ships took most of the Africans. It's estimated that out of that overall figure of 11 million, some 3 million approximately were carried by British ships. The British took their slaves mainly from West Africa. An equivalent number of Africans were also taken from the south central areas of the continent, places like modern Angola, and mainly by the other slave trading nations, Portugal, Spain, France, Denmark, the Dutch. Other nations also were involved. It suggested that 1% of the trade was conducted by Norwegian merchants and ships. The slave trade developed with the assistance of African and Arab traders who captured African victims and marched them to the ports where the slave trading vessels were waiting and onto which the uh, captives were loaded for the middle passage, as it was called, over to the West Indies and the Americas, north and south. And as is now, I think, well understood, slavery was intrinsic to African society and tribal life. Slaves were taken in warfare or in punishment for debt. 
or for their crimes. There were, of course, African slaves in Islamic and Ottoman lands in this period. India and other parts of Asia enslaved many millions, some of them in debt bondage. In Europe, there were tens of millions of serfs forced to do labor for their lords in Prussia, in Austria, and of course, in Russia. So what we're looking at is a world, a world of forced labor. And this prompted Adam Smith, the, the great Scottish moral philosopher and economist, to observe in 1763, in one of his lectures in the University of Glasgow, that slavery has hardly any possibility of being abolished. It has been universal in the beginnings of society and the love of dominion and authority over others will probably make it perpetual. So slavery was almost universally accepted as the norm in England up until the 1780s. One historian makes the claim that if you buttonholed people in London in 1787, say, and that was the year that anti-slavery became an organized movement. And if you'd insisted to them that slavery was morally wrong and should be stopped, nine out of 10 listeners, he writes, would have laughed you off as a crackpot. According to another, British abolitionists faced the challenge of ending slavery in a world that considered it fully normal. So given all of this, and given that it took about half a century in Britain to end slavery in the British Empire, is that a long or in fact a relatively short time? In some perspectives, it's remarkable that an institution as old and embedded in human history as slavery was ended so quickly. Britain's anti-slavery movement was the first to challenge forced labor and it pioneered techniques of mass campaigning that have dominated popular politics, not only in Britain, but all over the world ever since. And this is why studying the movement is so important. It was the first of many such in Europe and around the world. Indeed, it may well have been, it's been claimed, the first movement wholly dedicated to the achievement of someone else's rights. And what's more, those others were people of color who lived on another continent. In short, it was a remarkable movement. So our first question this evening is why should it have come into being in the 1780s? Some historians have talked of a rise of humanitarianism in the late 18th century and would therefore trace the effects of that on the anti-slavery movement. But that I think is merely to rephrase our question. Why should humanitarianism have emerged at this stage? I think we're on firmer ground by focusing on religion and on Quakers and evangelical Christians in particular. Both were notable for their belief in an essential religious equality among all people. All were capable of religious inspiration, however humble, and all were of equal spiritual and moral worth. And the Quakers, in addition, knew what it was like to be persecuted and excluded as a minority, and it's been suggested, therefore, had a natural affinity for the slaves. The most famous of the evangelical Anglicans were gathered together in the so-called Clapham sect, based upon that location uh, south of the centre of London, where they chose to live together in close spiritual proximity. They included some of the most famous names in the movement, William Wilberforce, James Stephen, Henry Thornton, the Macaulay family, the Venns, and their leadership threw up a kind of paradox as well. Those at the very forefront of this progressive cause were in other respects deeply conservative. These people were generally Tories in politics, opposed to social change moralistic and censorious in their public as well as their private attitudes. They led the movement in the name of God and the Bible rather than liberalism and social progress. But a third theme, quite obviously in this period, were the revolutionary ideas of the age 
drawn from America and from France, America in the 1770s and 1780s, and of course, France in the 1790s. Revolutionary individualism, the idea of contractual government, the idea of human rights, first as it were written down, arguably in the Declaration of the Rights of Man of 1791 in France, summed up these new ideas, though in neither case, neither in the case of the American Revolution, nor of course the French Revolution, at least uh, over time, uh, did this lead directly to emancipation. Again, I think uh, uh, for the British movement, we're on firmer ground if we look north of the border to the Scottish Enlightenment and to a new way of thinking, both about economics and about history. This is a great movement associated with Adam Smith, David Hume, Dougald Stewart, and many other notable intellects uh, clustered around the universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh and Aberdeen. And in the view of many coming out of the Scottish Enlightenment, slavery was an inefficient form of labor. And they laid down the basis for a liberal critique of, of slavery that ran right through the 19th century, that free labor was a much more efficient, as well as a morally more acceptable form of labor. They also developed a view of history that implied an equality of all races. So-called stadial history, a history of mankind divided into stages through which all races would pass, though they were at different stages in their journey, meant that Africans were not inherently any different from Caucasians. They were just nearer the beginning of their civilizational journey, which would lead eventually towards the stage of commercial society which Europeans had reached by the mid 18th century. My own work at present is on someone called Henry Broom. Broom rose to become a leading Whig politician of the 1820s and the 1830s, very central to many of the uh, issues we'll be talking about in this lecture. He'd come from Edinburgh. He was educated at Edinburgh University. He was a founder of the Edinburgh Review, and he brought these Scottish ideas with him to England in the early years of the 19th century, working his way into the Whig party, but also working his way into the very inner circles of William Wilberforce, the Clapham sect and the evangelicals who recognized that his hard headed case for freedom based upon this new thinking, economic and historical, might have rather more uh, likelihood of success dealing with hard headed opponents of anti-slavery than their moralistic uh, and Christian arguments. But a fourth theme that is absolutely central to this concerns black agency and the fear of rebellion that this gave rise to. In Britain, we can think of this in two ways. <clears throat> the famous cases before the courts of James Somerset and James Knight the first in the English courts in 1772, the second in the Scottish court in 1777. But the resulting judgments in both cases seem to establish that no one in Britain could be a slave, that slave status disappeared on arrival in this country. And both cases draw attention to the special quality of British freedom under the law as it was then understood. We should not underestimate in this story a degree of national pride that ran through the anti-slavery movement that Britons could never be slaves and they should work therefore to ensure that this was true of other nations as well. We can also note the role of black activists in London and other cities in the late 18th century, especially of uh, black authors of narratives of their lives in, in slavery. They found a readership for their accounts and they made contact with the wider anti-slavery movement. The most famous of these, Olado Equiano, uh, wrote uh, the famous interesting narrative of his life. Uh, and he made friends with many of the leading figures in anti-slavery in London and also in Cambridge in the 1780s. <clears throat> 
But more important still than the domestic role of black activism in Britain in the late 18th century was the role of black rebellion in the Caribbean and in imperial history. There's a long history of rebel action uh, in the West Indies and Caribbean more generally in the uh, British uh, uh, dominions there from Tacky's rebellion in 1760 on Jamaica onwards. There were rebellions in the 1790s, including major uprisings in Jamaica and Grenada in 1795, then on Barbados in 1816, on Demerara, now part of Guyana, in 1823. And then at the moment of political climax in this story came Sharp's Rebellion, named after Samuel Sharp, its leader in Jamaica in 1831. Now of them all, the most significant rebellion was not in fact on, on a British uh, colonial uh, um, possession, but on Saint-Domingue, now we know it as Haiti, in 1791. And you will probably know something of the complex story of this rebellion uh, and of the many different uh, armies in the field, uh, but you will perhaps know that at the end of a dozen years and more of fighting, an impoverished and broken Haiti declared independence on the 1st of January 1804. Now for five years from 1795, what's perhaps less well known is that British troops in very large numbers tried to pacify the island of Saint-Domingue for two reasons really, in order to gain control of its wealth. We were at war after all with the French uh, in the mid 1790s, but also to prevent the contagion of slave rebellion from, spe from spreading to other islands that we, the British, directly controlled. I have to tell you that the British troops who were sent failed abysmally. It's estimated that half of the 90,000 soldiers sent there from Britain and British possessions died in battle or of wounds or from disease, and they were joined by another 20,000 uh, dead sailors. Now, after the Haitian revolt, the fear of slave rebellion became a fixture in the public mind across the Atlantic world. In some, of course, it stimulated uh, a very harsh line in how to deal uh, with slaves. Uh, that was very much the case in the southern states uh, of the United States in the early 19th century. But of course, in others, it stimulated the idea that only full emancipation would bring such wars to an end and save both white and black lives as well. The disillusion and the change of attitude among the British as a consequence of the involvement in the uh, utterly failed Haitian campaigns of the 1790s was palpable. Defeat there showed the limits of imperial power, but also the possibility of black emancipation violently if necessary all over the West Indies where uh, Britain's slave empire was based. It was better surely to grant freedom peacefully than risk the very islands themselves and thousands of lives in rebellions. In addition, another argument deployed against Wilberforce and the abolitionists had fallen as a consequence of the Haitian revolt. The success of African armies against European troops, against the French, nullified the oft repeated concern that if Britain ended the slave trade, France might come to dominate it and dominate also the whole economy of sugar in the West Indies. What happened on Haiti destroyed the argument that Britain's act of generosity in regard to slavery would rebound to French advantage. Now we might consider for a moment the methods that we used in the anti-slavery campaigns that ran from the 1780s to the 1830s. Let me begin with one theme, which is not exactly a method so much as a concern about who is participating. 
And one of the most notable features of the whole campaign from the 1780s onwards is the participation of British women in anti-slavery. It said that British women spoke for the first time in the 1780s in public as part of the emerging anti-slavery, uh, anti-slave um, uh, trade campaign. Um, in the mid 1820s, it was a woman, Elizabeth Hayrick, previously a school teacher, a Quaker as well, who first campaigned for immediate as opposed to gradual emancipation, an idea that spread very quickly through the movement in the late 1820s. In 1826, it was a women's committee in Sheffield that became the first corporate body in the anti-slavery movement to call for immediate emancipation. And for historians of the women's movement in the 19th century, women's participation in the anti-slavery movement in the early and mid 19th century is a crucial conduit, a place as it were, where women learned the techniques of public speaking, of mass organization, which were then transferred to their own emancipation from the 1850s onwards. Petitions were crucial to the movement. In 1788, just a year really after the national movement had been established, 103 petitions were sent to Parliament containing around 80,000 signatures. This was a new and, and popular form of activism and it was used throughout the decades of the anti-slavery movement uh, to draw attention, not only in a sense to the cause itself, but to the hundreds of thousands of people whose signatures showed they were supporting the movement as well. These petitions, of course, were sent to both houses of parliament. The movement also pioneered the use of images as uh, elements of political persuasion and propaganda. And I'm sure you've got in your mind's eye as I speak, two very famous images uh, that if we had time, I would show you. The first is of a slave ship loaded with slaves. It's actually a, a known ship. It was known as the Brooks. It was owned by a Liverpool family. And Thomas Clarkson, truly the great hero of the anti-slavery movement, had this ship, as it were, drawn diagrammatically with 482 slaves in its hold, matchstick figures crammed into every space in order to draw attention to the conditions in which the slave trade proceeded. And it was reproduced in all media, books, magazines, newspapers, pamphlets. And of course, Clarkson himself took it as a sort of poster with him wherever he went on horseback uh, to draw attention to anti-slavery and to the, the, um, the immorality of the slave trade, uh, which of course was part of his great campaign uh, through the 1780s and 1790s in provincial England. The second image is that of Josiah Wedgwood's famous uh, uh, um, uh, porcelain image of a kneeling African in chains, lifting his hands as if in prayer, encircled by the words, am I not a man and a brother? There were also among these methods, boycotts of slave grown produce, above all, of course, sugar. The first of them starting in 1791, directly after the defeat of a motion in parliament to abolish the slave trade. Clarkson estimated from his journeys that summer, the summer of 1791, that no fewer than 300,000 persons had abandoned the use of sugar. Some contemporaries set the number even higher and it grew and it grew in the early decades of the 19th century um, to, to as it were, offer slave grown sugar in polite society uh, became um, a, a something of a, of, a, of a socially outre thing to do. Uh, this was the first large scale consumer boycott in modern history. And of course, there were many more of them in the 19th century and up to the, the present. The movement was also very interesting for the way it systematically collected data 
and disseminated facts. Um, it was fascinated by statistical and numerical details of what is, after all, um, a, a subject full, full of statistics of death and disease uh, and exploitation. And the movement collected together uh, vast amounts of data and would fill, as it were, pamphlets, books, uh, digests of parliamentary uh, inquiries and so forth, and spread that, disseminating it through its organizations around the country. And again, it shows a, a new kind of approach to mass campaigning. These campaigns, it must be said, were required because the anti-slavery movement faced considerable organized opposition in the so-called West Indian interest. Anti-slavery was met by a strong and well-resourced planter interest in this country, the West India Committee holding it together. It was made up really of two groups, the committee, slaveholders who were the, the dominant group uh, in, in that committee, but also representatives of the slave traders and the sea captains. In the 1820s, for example, it was estimated that as many as 50 MPs were part of this block in Parliament. Beyond that, the movement had to deal with the colonial assemblies. Now, many of these established in the 17th century as forums for white planters had been granted then or had established through precedent extensive powers of self-government making it very difficult indeed for the imperial government in London to cajole or force the slaveholding whites towards anti-slavery measures and policies. And by the 1820s, the anti-slavery movement in Britain was, I think, less focused on the West India Committee at home and more focused on the problems of, of getting the colonial assemblies uh, to move an inch in, in the direction of emancipation. Now, the organization of anti-slavery really has three great climaxes to it, and I'll just take you through them uh, to give a sense of the chronology. Uh, the first great movement occurred between 1787 and 1792. In 1787, the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade was established, and this was the first great anti-slavery organization. This was Wilberforce's organization. And there was a sudden explosion of public interest in anti-slavery, reaching a high point in the debate in Parliament in 1792 on Wilberforce's motion to end the slave trade. Um, the motion, in fact, passed both houses, but only with the insertion of the word gradually into the text. Parliament had indicated its willingness to end the trade, but only at some unspecified date or time in the future, and only by degrees. But this high point in 1792 was followed by the declaration of war against France in 1793. And with it came the suppression of domestic radicalism in Britain as the government cracked down on oppositional movements, fearful uh, of the potential for a revolutionary situation uh, to develop in this country. And for a decade, anti-slavery was in decline. The times were simply not propitious. But then from 1804, the movement was reinvigorated during a brief period of peace with France and led again by Wilberforce in the House of Commons. It managed in that year to win the support to both houses of parliament for the abolition of the slave trade. The argument was won, but it still took three more years to achieve actual majorities in both houses. Now, there's a tendency to neglect the next phase of the movement as the issue changed from that of the slave trade to slavery itself. Because the movement, though it whispered it quietly to itself, had always ultimately, I think, been focused on the emancipation of all slaves in the British Empire. Ending the slave trade was, in many views, 
one step towards that ultimate goal. Though that could not be said in public, of course, because it would almost certainly have increased opposition to the initial movement uh, regarding the trade itself. But from 1828, there's a third climax in the movement. And the movement at this point depends ultimately on political change in parliament. And it reemerges, therefore, as the whole question of parliamentary reform itself reemerged at this time. The two causes, anti slavery and parliamentary reform, then march together. Once the old Tory Anglican dominance of politics was reduced in its potency by parliamentary reform, it was one of the great and early achievements of the reformed House of Commons after the 1832 general election that it emancipated all the slaves in the British Empire. A more representative parliament after 1832 was by definition an anti-slavery parliament in which the size of the West Indian interest had been drastically reduced. So to sum up, at the end of the 1820s, three factors came together to give new life to the movement. Political reform, a revived anti-slavery movement, now with women and more religious non-conformists at its head, and also now with far more activists committed to immediatism rather than gradualism. And also something I've mentioned already, black agency in the form of Sharp's rebellion in Jamaica, which it must be said really frightened the planters and broke their resolve to oppose change. The Emancipation Act was passed in 1833 and it came into effect on the 1st of August 1834, a date that was celebrated for many years afterwards all across the Atlantic world. But at that point, there were still more than two million slaves in the southern states of America, more than a million and a half slaves in Brazil, perhaps half a million slaves on the Spanish island of Cuba. And it was to the international campaign to end slavery that the British movement now turned, led by a new organization, the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. Well, briefly, why did anti-slavery succeed in Britain and in Britain first? I think some of the answers I hope are clear in what I've said already, but some more factors can be thrown in. First of all, we benefit in this country from a compact geography. Um, and though we may not recognize it, uh, communications in the late 18th and early 19th century in Britain were undoubtedly better than in other European states uh, of comparable size. Um, roads, a compact geography, even an effective postal service, again in relative terms, uh, meant that it was possible uh, to organize a national mass campaign. The profusion and proliferation of newspapers spread the word. A dozen newspapers, most of them dailies, were emanating from London uh, by the 1780s. A large publishing industry made it possible to print pamphlets and periodicals easily, and libraries and booksellers in large numbers uh, were able to disseminate this literature uh, to a wide and widening reading public. There was also, of course, a pre-existing culture of direct public action and protest. The role of the crowd in 18th century British history and the moral economy of ordinary people is well attested in the historiography of popular action and mass movements. But we might extend Edward Thompson's argument to contend that slavery, just like high prices and monopolies, infringed a different type of moral economy of many ordinary people. We might extend that concept of a moral economy uh, and apply it to this widening sympathy for the slaves, uh, which took in so many different groups and classes by the early 19th century. So let me then conclude very briefly. Slavery and the slave trade were central to the history of early modern Britain. Anti-slavery, meanwhile, is one of the great movements of 
modern British history, with lingering legacies, of course, throughout the 19th century, and indeed even into our own day, when now we struggle with so-called modern slavery. The two, slavery and anti-slavery, have to be taken together and held in balance. And that has not always been the case in recent discussions and investigations. Both, I think, in fact, have been neglected in the standard histories of the 18th and 19th centuries up to now, and both deserve a much more central place in the British narrative. But in everything that we, we write and say and do in relation to these subjects, we certainly need to be true and faithful to the history. Uh, in my view, the more widely that history is spread and properly understood, the better. And this lecture has been offered in that spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for a, a remarkable tour de force and tour d'horizon, as the French say, to over this enormously important and fascinating subject. Uh, I must admit, I, it had never occurred to me that the, as you said at the beginning, three quarters of the world's population were subject to bondage. Um, and I'm sure that many of us were struck by that figure, which um, I, I think we should be more aware of. And, and, and so thank you for taking us through this extraordinary story and the, the 50 years, which as you say, is a remarkably short period to have overcome such a powerful uh, and, and, and ancient uh, institution, abuse. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we are delighted. Uh, Lawrence has agreed that he will um, address your questions and there are already three uh, in the question and answer box. So those of you who'd like to ask questions, do please write them in. Uh, we have uh, we have plenty of time for asking them, and I'm going to be the 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 as it were the uh, the, the virtual chair. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with the first question we had, which is really to to well, of course they're all to Lawrence. Given the vitriol against academics like you, uh, says our questioner, explaining the context and the nuances, um, is it the same experience, i.e., vitriol for academics in other countries? Hmm. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, one of the great things uh, in my life is that I'm not on social media. So if there's vitriol, I'm not even aware of it, actually. I, I, I'm continuing to, uh, uh, to continue, you might say. Um, I, I think um, I, I, it's difficult to say, really, and I wouldn't want to generalize um, about other places and other subjects, as it were. Um, I, I know the United States uh, best of all. Um, and I think in America, actually, there is um, a, a, a strong body of empirical historians who address precisely this subject, though in the American context, the subject is American slavery, and do so in the best possible manner. Um, I've spent more of my time reading and thinking and teaching the history of American slavery than British slavery. Uh, and I've read over the years some tremendous works of empirical history, um, which uh, suggest to me that uh, many American historians are unmoved by the vitriol or any sort of criticism that they receive. I, I think an, uh, if we bring this down to something um, uh, very recent, um, <clears throat> I was deeply impressed by some of the finest historians of slavery in America, uh, and indeed of American history more generally, who took on openly the so-called 1619 project of the New York Times, you may have heard of that, um, which uh, in its favor wanted to put the history of American slavery at the very heart of the American experience, but made a range of wild uh, assumptions and claims for that history, which simply do not bear uh, um, close scrutiny uh, when one thinks of, of the facts and the history that we know. And to the great credit of a number of very notable American historians, whatever the criticism and the vitriol, uh, they spoke up 
for the history as it should be understood uh, and as it should be based upon the sources and the facts. Um, I admire that. Uh, and so certainly in America, there are plenty who I think uh, are prepared to, to uh, as it were, appear in public and make the case for an, an accurate history. Well, that, that you refer to America, and that brings, us, brings me on to our second question, which is about the influence of American race culture, if one can call it that, on, on Britain, and whether that makes it more difficult for us to understand our own history. And the question gives the example of the, the World Cup, the England team took the knee while the USA team didn't. I mean, have we become very Americanized in our understanding of this question? Yeah, yes, that's that's very interesting. And again, I, I I I hesitate to go here because I'm I'm not a sociologist and I'm not a pundit of the present. Uh, I'm you know a common or garden historian interested in the past. Um, uh, so it's more difficult uh, uh, for me. What I think I, I can say, having spent forty years of my life going to and fro to America and having studied uh, at an American university and taught in American universities also, it, is that we're obviously uh, on the receiving end of a lot of essentially um, American concepts uh, about race and 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 other things um, in a way perhaps that has um, changed the flow. Historians in America used to be extremely influenced by British historiography, by the work of British historians. When I first went to America uh, as a young student, I, I, I was acclaimed really because I came as it were bearing the fruits of British scholarship and British historical ideas, which seemed so revolutionary and important to Americans at that time. Admittedly, uh, at that time, they were interested in questions of class, for example, not race, uh, 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 but other things. So I think the flow has, has, has if you like, reversed, uh, and the more dominant uh, um, cultural tradition is now American ideas flowing into Britain. Um, I, I, I don't think one should resist this. Um, as an empirical historian, I simply think one works with the grain of the facts. Um, uh, and I think um, uh, uh, I feel more comfortable always doing that. Uh, my history, I'd like to think, starts from, from the documents uh, and the established narratives rather than from the ideology or the, or the conceptual approach that then becomes, if you like, overbearing when one, when one looks at the history. I hope that makes some sense. Uh, well, we, ha we have a question which in a sense relates to that, Lawrence, and perhaps mm. in a way you've already answered it, you may want to say a word or two more. You, mm. how, how factual is our history? How best is fact described? Um, by the way, so this is a question of your lecture is incredibly interesting. Uh, thank you. I'll be sharing it with my friends and so on, which is just what we want, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. But um, how, how do you counter the, as it were, the I suppose, the, you know, the postmodern approach, which says, well, history is just interpretation and I've got my, you've got your facts and I've got my facts and you've got your history and I've got my history. Yes, I, I, um, I understand the question. Um, and I think all historians uh, struggle with it. Um, I, I think it's our duty as academic historians to uphold, how can I put it, a scholarly approach to the past. Um, one that grows out of the careful study of documentation and evidence, evidence of all sorts. Um, and that, as it were, um, has always something behind it, um, something that both restrains us in what we can say um, and that in many ways enables us, because if you have source material, you can be confident of what you say. Um, uh, now, that's, that's not, as it were, a, a perfect answer. Um, it, it doesn't, as it were, address uh, those historians and ideologists and people uh, who would want, as it were, to address these questions in quite a different way and for whom evidence matters far less. All that I would say to students, those viewing this, anyone interested in history is that, you know, turn to the back of the book and look at the sources. And if you see that there has been a real attempt to write the history based upon the reading uh, of sources, if, as it were, you have some confidence that the person who's writing the article or the book has actually engaged with uh, the material fully and fairly, 
then I think read on, uh, but always I think be be skeptical of those uh, for whom the facts obviously do not count, um, because I think they they will inevitably uh, distort and 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 make more problems for the rest of us. Oh, well, thank you, Lawrence. Now we have a couple of factual questions. Mm. I think you can will, you'll be able to answer pretty quickly or at least uh, re relatively quickly one is about the interesting you know the point you began with which i referred to earlier the people who lived in in some form of bondage mm -hmm. and the question would like would ask uh, how one distinguishes between slavery forced labor serfdom and indeed modern slavery could, could you uh, say yes, I, I, that, that it's a very interesting question and uh, the brush with which I was painting there was very, very broad indeed. Um, but I sub and, and essentially what, what I was saying and what you as a questioner have picked up it, it is that there are lots of different types of forced labour uh, then and, and now. Um, but what I think one would want to focus on uh, is, is a concept that was growing in the 18th and 19th centuries, that concept of freedom of contract. Uh, that idea that uh, we sell our labor on the basis of a contract and at any point uh, under the terms of that contract, we are free to withdraw our labor and go elsewhere. That we, if you like, are in command of our labor. We have choice over how we give our labor to whom and when and for what price. Um, and these ideas were very important. I, I, I recall uh, an interesting exchange with one of my professors when I was very young at, uh, at Yale, as, as Robert mentioned. Um, where uh, we were talking about this and I was trying to to make the case that someone like John Bright who owned a cotton mill and employed workers and probably could have played, paid them more in that cotton mill in the 1850s and the 1860s, nonetheless would have replied to any criticism, my workers have freedom of contract. They can go anywhere else to another mill down the road or somewhere completely different. And that is why even as a mill owner, I am committed to anti-slavery and the abolition of slavery in America because that's different. It's a form of forced labor. So I suppose what I'm saying here is that anything that is not genuine freedom of contract um, is a type of forced labor. But there are many different types of labor. Serfdom, for example, involves labor service on the land and Russian serfs literally labored for two, three, four days a week on the land of, of, of the noble uh, uh, and owed him service in that form. Quite different from slavery, for example, um, or debt bondage, for example. So there are lots of different ways of thinking about forced labor, uh, but the difference is always, is there freedom of contract? Some people who are critical of abolitionism or at least of the and often of the emphasis that we we give to it say that well these people were only interested in efficiency in other words their their abolitionism was self-interested there isn't a moral dimension it's because uh, they thought that free workers were, were were more efficient and perhaps even cheaper D what how do you how do you assess that within the yeah. whole abolitionist movement yes i i well uh, I think there are two ways of, of, of trying to deal with this, one much bigger and one, one more, more direct. Um, if you look for that kind of discourse in um, uh, the uh, anti-slavery movement in Britain, you won't really find it up to uh, the early 1830s, up to emancipation. Um, it is certainly true that out of Scotland came this idea very strongly um, uh, to the fore in The Wealth of Nations, written, of course, by Adam Smith in 1776, that um, uh, free labour is more efficient. Um, it, it shows greater um, uh, um, uh, uh, creativity, if you like. Uh, workers have incentives uh, and they're much more creative in the way they, they use their, their labor and their freedom. And that makes it more efficient. But it's a very generalized argument and you don't really find it much developed 
by um, the sort of Christian evangelicals um, and others who lead the anti-slavery movement. Um, I know that there is this argument, uh, but it's not one that you can find very strongly represented, indeed hardly at all represented, in the rhetoric and the arguments of the anti-slavery movement uh, in Britain, uh, which is moralistic, which is Christian, uh, which is certainly focused on the concept of Britain's wider national interests, uh, but which doesn't, as it were, make a, a limited economic argument that you can get more, more return out of a free labor force in Jamaica or Barbados uh, than you could do from, um, from a, a, a slave uh, labor force. Behind that, however, Robert, there is a much wider question, which I didn't really have time to go into this evening, which is uh, summed really in, in a book published in the 1940s, controversial then and still controversial by Eric Williams called Capitalism and Slavery. Um, and Williams there developed an argument uh, which really, in a sense, said that slave, slave culture in the West Indies was in decline in the early 19th century um, and that emancipation occurs um, and the anti-slavery movement wins um, uh, because, as it were, British interests are moving away from the sugar islands and uh, the primary products produced there and turning towards uh, the Industrial Revolution and the manufacture of, of export goods like textiles and so forth in Lancashire and Yorkshire from the 1830s. And that argument, which I think is still uh, current in some quarters, has been um, quite considerably critiqued uh, over the decades. Um, and um, uh, you could say you pay your money and you take your choice. But I think the overwhelming uh, weight of historical argument uh, it comes down against that view, um, which is sometimes held to be a little too glib uh, and which wants to reaffirm, certainly in recent work, the, <clears throat> the moral attributes and the moral um, um, uh, identity of the anti-slavery movement. Um, this is fundamentally about religion and conscience uh, and a belief in freedom. Um, it's not really about the calculation of best advantage, either nationally or in terms of an individual slaveholder or an individual industrial entrepreneur. One of the problems, I think, with the Williams argument is, is who is the agent in the transition, if you like, from slavery to industrialism? It certainly really isn't the central government in Britain because governments have so little control over uh, um, uh, the economy in the early 19th century. Uh, and certainly industrialization emerging from the 1770s and 1780s is a very grassroots phenomenon. It's not as if anybody is taking any sort of decision that we move from one form of capital to another. Um, they are, if you like, uh, two, two different economic complexes, uh, the one developing quite separately and independently uh, in the English Midlands and the north of England from the 1780s in an entirely different world from the uh, uh, world of Atlantic uh, merchants and slavery and the Caribbean sugar islands. Uh, so I, I, I would tend to keep them apart uh, and say that actually economic arguments in this in this subject are, are less important than than moral and political ones. Mm. Well, on the moral argument, if I could ask you something myself, mm. rising from my own, as it were, curiosity, I seem to remember. Well, I, I do remember reading a very interesting article some years ago. I think in the historical journal. I forgot the name of the author who was talking about the way in which slave owners were considered. So we know that there is, as you said, um, a, a growing recognition of the humanity and the equal humanity of, of the slaves, of the enslaved people. And this article was saying that the slave owners came to be seen, in, and perhaps I'm simplifying, but it's a sort of epitome of immorality. Mm. Their sexual abuse of slaves, their drunkenness, their, their uh, materialism and so on, meant that they, I suppose, on one hand, you have a, a rising moral image of, of the enslaved person, and perhaps at the same time, a, a, a degraded image of the slave owner. Is that, was that? Oh, 
without without question absolutely um they're they're held if you like in growing and increasing contempt uh, as the decades go by um and by the post napoleonic period there are uh, at least two uh, famous examples of slaveholders who behave um, with such brutality towards their slaves that they become pariahs in England. And, and again, there is a kind of up upthrust of, of contempt across uh, public media and even parliamentary opinion against these two particular slaveholders. One, in fact, is found guilty of murder and executed. The other lives on. Um, but you get uh, a growing... Um, um, critical um, uh, response uh, to people who behave in such appalling ways towards their slaves. I think this is associated not just, as it were, with humanitarianism and the desire to assist uh, 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 slaves in slavery and indeed to um, reduce the brutality of slavery, which is one technique, one, one tactic that the anti-slavery movement uh, certainly uh, takes up in the early 19th century. But I think it's, it's also a product, if you like, of, of, of a change in the moral atmosphere of Britain between, say, the 1770s and the 1830s. If you think about who's, who's leading the um, uh, the campaign against slavery, it's those evangelical Christians. And uh, for them, of course, um, uh, the behavior the, of, of, of slaveholders, not just in regard to their slaves, but the notions of luxury, of excess, of exploitation, uh, of uh, sexual appropriation and uh, sexual exploitation, all of these things are so ungodly and over time, of course, British society is changing its moral outlook. You know, by the mid 19th century, Victorian values, so called, uh, have emerged. And so slaveholders, in a sense, are throwbacks to another age as British moral society moves into a different kind of age uh, with a much more um, censorious view of personal conduct. Uh, these people are dinosaurs, um, not just because of the way they treat their slaves, but because of their general demeanour, uh, and they are shunned and hounded because of it. And yet, of course, and as we know, this is often raised as a criticism of the whole abolitionist process. Uh, and one of our questions raises it too: the fact that the, it's the slave owners who are paid compensation. Is this something, and of course it was controversial at the time, but I think it would be useful if you could say a word or two about the fact that, uh, you know, a large amount of money was paid to the slave owners. This yes, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, just to uh, put the facts down first, uh, in 1833, the Emancipation Act uh, decreed that uh, 20 million pounds would be paid in compensation. Uh, that was roughly 40% of uh, government expenditure in that year. Well, if you were to do a sum today in terms of 40% of government expenditure, it would be astronomically high, but it was still considered uh, to be first a very large sum indeed, but then on principle to be entirely wrong. Uh, as many pointed out, the compensation should go to the slaves, not to the slaveholders. But in a way it had to be paid, uh, that was almost uh, necessary to grease the palm of slaveholders in the final denouement of this 50 year struggle. Uh, it, was, it was necessary to give them an incentive, a further incentive uh, to give up their slaves. Um, and uh, as it were in, in a negotiation, uh, the government found it necessary uh, 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 to pay for what many thought was morally necessary and uh, an insupportable um, um, act. But but there you are. That's what sometimes um, peace deals are about. Um, the other part of the question: what 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 exactly did, did the questioner want, or or what what the view was of this at the time? Well, it was no. Was it the only way to ensure emancipation? I think you've answered. You've answered. Yes, I, I mean, uh, it would be fine to think that um, they would have accepted 
um, as it were, no, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and understood that the time was up. But they wanted to be paid, and a great national sum had to be had to be, as it were, done. Uh, uh, it, the twenty million had to be very carefully divided between great slaveholders who might have more than a thousand slaves and be paid thousands of pounds. And many of these people were already fabulously wealthy. Or, as was often the case, the individual, the widow, who might own half of a slave. Uh, and uh, the, the work that's been done, very good work indeed, on the business of compensation shows how broad was the ownership of slaves in British society. It's not just a very large scale absentee owners who already own broad acres in this country, but it's a whole variety of, of, of figures who owned one or two slaves or even as it were half a slave uh, and drew a small income from that. Mm. Questions have been coming in thick and fast, Lawrence. Have you got a few more minutes? Yes, certainly. Right. Well, a uh, couple of quick questions. Was the Duke of Wellington a defender of slavery? Do you know, I, 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 I couldn't... I couldn't swear to know the answer to that. Uh, I think he probably was, um, but I can't actually. Um, I, I probably should know, but I can't. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't come to mind. I'm afraid. Not not a prominent one then. Uh, not, yeah. not a prominent voice on either side. Um, now this is a more difficult question, which you may not want to answer. But who was the most significant individual in Britain arguing against the abolitionists? The most oh. pro-slavery. Yeah. Ah, goodness me. Um, yes, I, I, uh, that would be difficult. I mean, um, I don't know that that uh, the um, oh goodness, the name of the Liverpool merchant. He'd been a, in the British Army. Uh, there was certainly one was Liverpool. Tarleton. Was it Tarleton? Oh, Tarleton, oh. exactly, Tarleton. Tarleton, for many years, uh, spoke up for the slave traders. Uh, his family had been involved in slave trading. And Tarleton was, I think, probably the most notable, uh, the most aggressive voice in the House of Commons. He'd uh, uh, fought in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, he then got himself a seat. Um, and he was, I think, the most vociferous um, and uh, in some ways the most frustrating of the um, opponents of the anti-slavery movement. Thank you, Robert Tarleton. Yes. Well, there's a wonderful portrait by Gainsborough here in the National Gallery. I almost hesitate to mention it in case it gets <laughs> removed <laughs> uh, or, 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 or covered in, uh, in marmalade. But um, please don't do that, anyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have a, I'm going, to, I'm going to amalgamate two questions, and that those may be our last questions, which is really to ask whether we, whether, whether we give too much prominence, or rather if, if we use, or if there is a tendency to use race as too simple a lens through which to, to view our history, and if, if there's any way of, of countering the tendency to teach critical race theory in schools and universities. Mm. Yes, I, I um, again, uh, I, I'm going to hesitate to talk about these questions today because I, I, I you know, I don't want to disappoint, but I don't feel myself to be uh, an expert on these on these matters. What I think you could say about anti-slavery and the history of it is that for many people, and I, I say this with a degree of, of hesitation, but I think for many of those involved, this, this was not a question that they saw, if you like, through a racial lens, if you understand me. Um, they felt that slavery as an institution was wrong, that uh, modernity mandated freedom, uh, political freedom, as well as economic freedom, uh, that um, uh, it, it led to exploitation and all those practices that we've already mentioned in this, in, in this discussion, that it was uh, an excrescence on civilization and should be removed. And I think they felt that, as it were, outside of a, a kind of a racial uh, paradigm, uh, this was simply wrong. Slavery itself was wrong. It was even more wrong, if you like, that um, uh, uh, if you like, a dominant race should enslave 
um, those who were less advanced in the civilizational sense. And this is where the Scottish Enlightenment historiography comes in, uh, because there, if you like, there is a very strong sense um, that um, all races are equal, as I said, um, despite, uh, as it were, color and, and um, um, uh, all other considerations, um, all races have the capacity to reach full civilizational um, um, uh, development. It's just that, as it were, some have started from a more primitive position than others. And there is a concept there also of stewardship, that it is our responsibility to assist those less fortunate and further back in, if you like, this, this developmental process uh, to come forward and, and, and fully embrace uh, what the, the, the Scots called commercial society. Now, this isn't uh, an awfully common view of slavery and anti-slavery, but it's, it's a rather interesting view based upon a concept of, of racial equality. Um, so I think I would say to, to these questions that uh, many in the anti-slavery movement held racial views that you wouldn't necessarily imagine. And it's important to, to also remember something else here. These are people of the early 19th century and the early 19th century is quite different in its views of, of, of social identities than the late 19th century. The late 19th century may well be a much more racist era where people think much more deterministically about if you like race and genetics and, and consider races to have uh, very obvious differences in, in their capacities, their intelligence and so forth. But this isn't what you hear in um, a lot of the anti-slavery rhetoric and argumentation uh, at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century. There's a much stronger sense coming out of the enlightenment of the equality of races and the, and the, and, and the similarity of all humans and that sense of obligation, therefore, to treat all races equally and fairly. It's a very different mindset uh, from one that developed, say, from the 1860s and the 1870s, and in my view, a much more attractive one as well. Uh, well, we, we, you're being very patient with questions. One which I think you've probably answered just now by implication, but it might be worth just saying, mm -hmm. it because one hears it quite often. Uh, some, one of our questioners says, the people who, whom you said would have regarded it as nonsensical to think that slavery could be abolished, as you said at the beginning of your lecture, yet they sing Britain's never, never, never shall be slaves. How do we reconcile those two things if, if we can? Oh, yes. Yes, I see what you mean. I, I think, uh, well, I think, it, I think they can be reconciled. Um, in the sense, I mean, I don't know what the man, the man in the streets of London in the 1780s would say, but I think they would say something along the lines of, of course, slavery is natural elsewhere in the world, uh, in places uh, less um, uh, fortunate than we here in England, uh, in places uh, uh, less um, um, uh, advanced, less economically sophisticated. Uh, we have, as it were, developed a, a culture of freedom. Uh, they, unfortunately, and it's it's not exactly the slave's fault, but they, in these benighted places elsewhere, um, they have to live with slavery because they haven't managed to develop those civilizational um, uh, qualities uh, that we have managed. So there is an element here of uh, national pride, um, national arrogance perhaps, but also some sort of sympathy for those who have not yet uh, and perhaps will never achieve what, what the Brits have achieved. Uh, Britons never will be slaves. Um, and it's a nationalistic point. It's a point of national identity. It, it makes us, if you like, the people that we are in the 18th century, uh, that, that in this country we are free. Uh, in other countries, sadly, uh, they are not uh, as fortunate. So I don't know that it's, it's national arrogance. If that's the implication of the question, uh, I don't know that it's national arrogance. Obviously, there's a, there's a kind of paradox here. Um, uh, again, I think the hope would be that through civilizational advance, more peoples would um, 
um, uh, gain uh, uh, the kinds of liberties and freedoms that the English have. Uh, uh, I'm talking to Robert, who is an expert on French history. Um, of course, the British would look upon the French in the 18th century as a poor benighted people who lived under um, absolutist monarchies or failed absolutist monarchies uh, and who should develop the kinds of liberal freedoms and opportunities uh, that we here in England had developed. And I think you, in a sense, when you spoke to that Englishman in the street in the 1780s, what you get is a further development of that kind of argument. So few peoples are, are, are lucky enough to enjoy our freedoms and our opportunities. Well, thank you, Lawrence. Um, I think we will draw this to a close now. There are two questions that I can answer very quickly. One is, a, a, shall, is it possible to get the transcript? And the answer to that is yes, we shall be publishing it as soon as we can. The other question is about the um, Arab slave trade. I'm not going to ask you to comment on that because it would take an awfully long time. But I can say that we are going to welcome Professor Thomas Otty in a future webinar shortly, who will be talking about that very subject. So those interested, please do uh, listen in. But for now, uh, I'm going to thank you for a, a long and very full um, discussion, lecture and discussion of um, the campaign against slavery and uh, one that will give us all a lot, of, a lot to think about. And, um, uh, and I think for those of us uh, and, and of our questioners who are worried that uh, you know, history is being taught wrongly, we'll know that the empirical and factual-based and evidence-based approach that you have taken is, we hope, we trust, the way of combating the distortions of a certain kind of historical discourse. So thank you very much, Lawrence. And thank you to all our uh, questioners and to all our listeners, and we hope to uh, greet you again in due course. Thank you.